All right, let's go ahead and get started with uh, this month's uh, Lunch and Learn uh, webinar. Thank you everyone for uh, joining in. My name is Alex Chan. I work with the USTA Mid-Atlantic section in the Community Engagement Department. Um, thank you all for joining in today. Uh, this is, I think, the third, yeah, the third one that we have done um, in our webinar series. Every month we are doing at least one webinar that can um, be of value for our local CTAs slash NGTLs and whatnot. Um, each month we have a different topic and we're always looking for uh, new presenters. So if anyone in the audience is interested in uh, presenting on a topic that you think it's, um, will, be, will be relevant for the group, feel free to just reach out to me and we can talk about it. Um, anyone that ends up hosting, they will receive a, a $25 gift card did that tell you that, Jerry? You I'm not sure. Oh, I know. Okay. Wow. Okay. okay, yeah, so you're, you're getting a gift card. <laughs> so, bribes, bribes. Yeah, yeah so you're getting a gift card for helping to uh, present today. And at least starting for next few webinars, we're going to be doing a raffle for attendees. So we, we recently um, um, have a, a partnership with Tennis Warehouse where they are donating um, a, a $25 gift card that we will be raffling out to attendees. So everyone that's in the audience, make sure you stay to the very end because I'll, I'll take a screenshot of who, who's in the audience and then I will um, I will do a, a raffle and I'll, uh, I'll reach out to the person that won for that. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be cool. And just a few other housekeeping items I wanted to mention before we get started. Uh, there, I wanna give you all like, all, everyone that's in this uh, webinar a heads up that there is a new national grant called Grow to Game Grant. Um, it's going to be uh, officially released and announced on the 20th. So that's this Thursday. And what this grant does is uh, we're giving out money to facilities and organizations that are running programs that are geared towards um, servicing new and returning players, which for most of you all, I'm pretty sure like, most of you are doing that. Um, so I'll be in touch with a lot of you regarding how that works out, but just stay tuned for the May, uh, May 20th announcement from National. Uh, we're gonna have a section announcements as well. And we'll be regularly checking in to see, you know, making sure people are uh, they're eligible to uh, encourage them to apply because we do have some money to give out and we wanna make sure that Mid-Atlantic is <laughs> utilizing that money, right? So that should be great. That's, that's gonna be a good, a good initiative. I will also be doing a, um, a webinar um, that goes more into details about the grant and all that entails. Um, you can go ahead and save the date on your calendar. It's going to be on uh, Tuesday, June 1st, uh, 12 to 1. So basically two weeks from now, I'll be doing a, um, a webinar on it. So, yep, looking forward to uh, discussing that. Uh, so with that said, I want to go ahead and uh, just kind of quickly introduce uh, the speaker for today. It's uh, Jerry Ingram. Um, she will be going over a lot of, uh, a, a lot of information regarding CTAs as far as what you all should know and what are, the, what, what are all the stuff that's out there for you all. So I'm going to pass on to Jerry to go ahead and introduce yourself and we can get started. All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon at this point. How are you? Thank you for joining. Um, thank you, Alex, for inviting me onto the webinar. I, I do have to say when Alex asked me to speak, I was um, very pleased to be able to speak to CTAs in the Mid-Atlantic. I do a lot of um, uh, national webinars and a, a lot of sharing from the national platform. And so um, what I'm really interested in is sharing the information with you, but also taking the time to answer the questions from the local CTAs and, and become a resource that um, you all can use um, to, in the future and help you uh, through the CTA the CTA process. Um, as you um, know, I, well, you know, I'm the CTA chair, but this is my third term. So I've been in this position for six years. I was the vice chair before that. So I've been on the CTA committee for eight years. So um, I'm going to go through the slides. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each slide because I probably could talk for three hours as, with as much information as I have. But um, I will go back to any slides that you want me to go back to um, to get your questions answered. I'm also the uh, founder of Metropolitan Tennis and Education Group, uh, which is a CTA, it, as well as an NJTL, which we'll also talk about a little later in the presentation. And as well as I've you know, played tennis in the Mid-Atlantic 
um, played um, high school and college tennis in the Mid-Atlantic as well as on the professional tour and also um, a number of other volunteer opportunities such as the Mid-Atlantic Board as well as a, a number of committees. So um, any, any question that you have for me, um, I will do my best to answer or provide a resource uh, for you. So I am moving the slides, right, Alex? Okay, so this is this presentation is uh, tennis uh, CTA 101 because of what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of go over some of the things um, that individuals may need to know which qualifies them as a CTA. Uh, for me myself, um, I actually kind of put the cart before the horse. I, I was already in the programming space and moving in the direction of what the tennis on court looked like, but I needed to go back and um, create the infrastructure that was needed to, to get the full benefit of actually being a CTA. But really, um, without reading the slide, the, the basis of what a CTA is, is um, one, it's a not-for-profit, not which like Alex said at the beginning of the presentation qualifies you to receive grants. So that's a very important piece. Um, and then also it's a it's an organization that may have staff, but it has volunteers. And really it's a space where you can put a number of programming opportunities, competitive opportunities, social opportunities in one place for, for people in the community to access. And this also means that you're open to all. So we're not talking about country clubs or private clubs, but, and, 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 and we are inclusive of all. So if people belong to those clubs, that's fine, but you do not have to um, belong per se to be, to be associated with a CTA. So in order to register as an official CTA with the USDA, um, some of those things that, some of the things that need to happen is a membership, an organization membership, not your individual membership um, with the USDA. Uh, these are the links um, and um, they can be provided as well in the chat, uh, uh, Alex, or if, if anybody would like them at the end. Um, there's an application uh, on, as a committee member and a chair, we've, um, every term we've tried to streamline the application. Um, to make it simpler and um, easy to fill out uh, as industry standards change and also to kind of um, separate and incorporate the difference between a CTA um, and, and an NJTL. So the application is online um, and it's, it's pretty uh, simple to go through. And if you have any questions as you're going through it, um, the, the staff is willing to help it also allows you to kind of see where you are and to see what you may need to do in order to fully benefit from the process of, of, of being a CTA. Okay, so I would definitely say that, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, if I'm already functioning as a tennis organization, and every day or the past few years, um, I go through my, through my year and everything is just fine. Why would I go through this process? What are the benefits of becoming a CTA? In my eyes, the, the, one of the biggest benefits is the insurance. Um, the insurance is at a much uh, cheaper rate than, than a typical industry insurance um, policy that you would purchase. Um, there's also the assistance from the USTA with updates in the industry, trainings that are available, facility grants, as, as Alex um, spoke of, um, information on partnerships and really like best practices, documents, and how to go about doing everything you need to do for your board um, and in, in, in your nonprofit status. Um, a, a big um, Part of the information sharing is one kind of what we're doing now. Uh, there's also the national webinar series. And then there's also, as we go through this, you'll see a number of documents where you kind of don't have to re reinvent the wheel. You don't have to figure out what needs to be done. The step-by-step -step process is um, already on the website and also in tools you would receive as a CTA. Right now, there are about 680 CTAs registered this year. 
Typically that number gets to be between 700 and 800 and registrations amp up as we move into spring and summer, um, primarily because of the insurance piece. And as we all go outside, CTAs um, you know, start to um, get ready for the possibilities of injury or any type of any, anything that could happen. I mean, and, and CTAs, there are lawsuits <laughs> among CTAs. Uh, so uh, that the insurance protects you and it doesn't only protect you, it protects your board, it protects also the participants. I'm sorry. And one last thing, you know, there's also um, the awards. If, if you're interested in, in awards, um, there's a CTA of the year award every year. And that is not just for large CTAs, it's for small CTAs, rural, urban, new. Um, there, there, there are a variation of awards that are given out. And um, so recognition helps sometimes CTAs with advocacy in their community in their state um, when they're maybe looking for facility improvements or even really just a space to have a program. Um, these type of things can kind of show, validate them with the governing body. Okay, uh, so the business of a community tennis association. Well, as you know, as a nonprofit, there are some things that need to be in place. Um, as you run your annual business. So a board of directors, creating your bylaws, uh, your mission statement, um, you definitely would have to register with your state. So your articles of incorporation, uh, like any business, uh, EIN number. Um, and then once you get to the piece where you wanna register with the USCA, that allows you to go into the insurance programs. Uh, and then last but not least, because you are a nonprofit, you definitely have to um, file your 990 and that would be annually, but that also allows you to benefit from, from grants and from fundraising and uh, donations and a lot of things to support the CTA that um, things like private clubs and country clubs and, and maybe even fitness centers that have tennis courts that don't have uh, like a monthly or annual membership coming in. Um, that helps you sustain your business. Okay, and so then once once you kind of get through the background of you know the business that the customer may not see, it's kind of like what do you want to do? What direction do you want to go in? How do you how do you grow your CTA so it thrives? And you know we all have our peaks and valleys in our businesses, but you know what are we, what are we going to do? To, to keep the ebb and flow of business going, um, whether it's spring and summer or, you know, tennis, you know, especially in the mid-Atlantic, there's a crunch for court time in the winter. So what, what, are, what are we gonna do so our CTA grows and so it can still either flourish or survive um, when, when business is not as high? So obviously there's all these different departments um, within the CTA and you don't have to focus on all of them. Um, you can really, that's what's fun about a CTA, they're all different. You can really decide, you know, what, what you're interested in, what your board is interested in, your customers, and what really kind of works well for you based on where you're located. So on the, on the website, um, actually, I did not put the website link on here, Alex, my apologies. I mean, we can put it in the chat. Uh, on the website, there are these resources. Um, and the re well, the, the top one is the resource guide. So the resource guide kind of tells you, you know, where you can get the information. And it also gives you the step-by-step -step process of, of what you need to do to ensure that your CTA infrastructure, that you, you know, you stay in good standing with the, uh, with the federal government as well as your state, and that um, you continue to do business in a way that your that your books are in order and that and that you can also grow and sustain your business. The health check is um, a resource that kind of you do once you have everything in place and things change within the industry, you can go back and kind of see where you are. The, these resources make it so you don't have to think about it. So it's like this is this is what you need, 
And these are updated annually. So as part of the committee work, we, we definitely go in to see what best practices are. Uh, right now, you know, for instance, a good example is there's a lot of COVID information there that wasn't there obviously two years ago. Uh, the safe play information that, you know, it's been there, but, you know, things have changed. And then also um, there are industry standards and association standards within the nonprofit space too that, that get updated there regularly. The webinar series, and I'm not going to read every single one, but the, the webinar series is definitely a good resource and it hits different departments within the USTA that kind of branch into your CTA business and you can kind of pick and choose what works well for you. And then, you know, we're, we're in the parks, we're in the schools, where some of us are even in private clubs, but there's always um, a need to kind of see maybe what needs to be done next as relationships um, go through their life cycle. Okay, so the CTA insurance. Um, this is this is really big because um, there 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 are two different types of insurance. One is your general, so you have your master liability insurance, um, and that includes even though you get the discount through the USCA, it does not have to be a USCA activity for you to be covered. So it's USCA and non USTA business. Uh, it includes tournaments. And it also just includes any related events that you have going on with your program. And then you also have the DNO coverage. So that, that really covers your board of directors. Um, so the, the, the business decisions are made, um, really any lawsuits that may come against the organization. And it may, it may, you know, COVID was a big thing, you know, if someone got COVID while they were in your programming, well, as we know, we can't really, we couldn't and can't really pinpoint when that happens, or maybe somebody gets injured while they're in a program or playing a league match and just things that, that may come about. So um, this insurance covers you on, on different levels. And here you'll kind of see the details of the highlights of the insurance. I'm definitely not an insurance agent, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to justify or or explain away what um, what the insurance will will do if something like this happens. But I can say that um, my organization has had the insurance. Um, we've been in business for six years, and so we've had insurance since the beginning, and um, everything has gone well when we've had to reach out as far as registering um, the coverage, um, adding adding um, facilities, because um, we are in a number of spaces, schools, parks, and sometimes private clubs, adding those um, entities onto our policy when needed, all of that goes smooth and quickly. Oops. And then the, this is the, um, the details of the DNO insurance. And actually, to be honest, um, from my experience with um, MTEG, we have not had to make any calls in this in this space, um, but we do we we do get it every year. Okay, and then and then we get to the fun part. So you know you get to design your product. CTA, I mean the the infrastructure of a CTA is that you're open to everyone. Uh, there's staff. There's volunteers. There's programming, there's competition, um, there's social activities, which can include, include travel opportunities, such as maybe a trip to the US Open or even a, a local field trip to the city open. Uh, and then sometimes you have education. So whatever you wanna do um, to have fun and compete, whatever your org organization is interested in, that's where you get to sit down with your staff, sit down with your board, um, take information from your customers and kind of just design your product and roll with it. You know, tennis, as much as it is uh, CTA has become a business, tennis is a sport, which comes under the entertainment category. So we should be having fun. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where you go with it after, after you get everything in place so you can be a responsible CTA. So, I'm gonna give an example. I'm gonna use my organization as an example just because 
more than likely it's the one I know best, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so the question is, are you an NJ, are you a CTA or an NJTL? And, and really um, not only do organization, organizations struggle with this sometime, but um, we've actually just struggled with this um, from our committee standpoint. And, I, and as a liaison to the NJTL committee, um, you know, you can be both. So, and does that matter? Well, both of them are nonprofit and um, really both of them serve everyone, but with an NJTL, the big difference is, are you providing tennis and education ac academic enrichment? And are you offering free or low cost tennis and education programming? So that would really be the difference. Um, either one is fine. Uh, sometimes though, there are different grant opportunities depending on what space you're living in. So, and then also too, what do you wanna spend your time on throughout the year as you program? NJTLs more than likely would require additional fundraising opportunities, donation opportunities, and take you into different spaces. Um, but, you know, if you're a CTA and you wanna focus on the volunteering and the programming that doesn't take you into the underserved community as much, that's fine. And if you do, if you are an NJTL, then you might wanna look into the resources that the USDA Foundation and the section have to offer for those organizations. And I say all that to say because uh, Metropolitan Tennis and Education Group is a CTA as well as an NJTL. So, we really designed our programming um, on the backs of um, juniors initially. And what we wanted to do was ensure that we provided uh, a complete pipeline of opportunities. Um, we definitely wanted to service the entry level grassroots individual. And sometimes that is a participant that fits the NJTL model and sometimes it isn't. Um, a lot of people start in the parks um, a lot of people start just kind of on their own. So then we would offer some type, type of structure to their game and to their programming. And eventually if they became a competitive player, then we would introduce them to the competitive pipeline. And in that process, we have um, started programming with grassroots um, individuals. And now we, we have a individual who is playing on the WTA tour who is now we have renamed our excellence team. We have an excellence team through the foundation um, to team the Ganaway. Uh, Claire V was on a number of our JTT teams in our programming from the time she was um, nine or 10 years old. And she is an exceptional player. And so now we have moved into that space. We also have scholarship opportunities and we assist with juniors getting into private schools um, for their tennis and education. But we also have adult programming. Um, we do group lessons, we do private lessons, um, we have a league team, um, we, do, we have a live ball program that um, is very popular. And then we also definitely do a lot with our board as far as fundraising and development, partnerships within the community. So, um, we're not a membership-based organization and we are definitely open to everyone. So um, we include volunteers, we include staff, uh, and so we kind of live in both spaces. So um, with that being said, that is kind of like how we designed our program. And, and we, I would have to say, we are an organization who kind of went backwards. We started off programming because myself as a player and as a coach, and then the other staff in the organization really came from the coaching space. We kind of just hit the ground running. And then we took a step back and said, okay, we have to get our infrastructure in place so we can really support our organization and our players in a better way. So um, these are some of the highlights um, from, from our players and in our organization. We've been in business um, as a nonprofit for six years. And let's see. And last but not least, questions. Great, Jerry, thank you for, uh, for sharing all that great information. And we do have 
uh, at least two questions that have came in. Uh, okay. So let me quote one. Uh, the first question is, how do you determine when to expand into new, new programming thing areas? Or yeah, I think that's what I meant. So how, how do you determine when to expand into new programming? So when you say new programming areas, what do you, what do you mean exactly? Meaning as far as, I'm sorry, juniors, adults? It, uh, I don't think they uh, elaborate more, much more okay. than that, but maybe you can maybe give them both ends. Like how, how like for you, like how do you determine when you wanted to grow into more, yeah, you know, the youth or adult space? For us, one, there's two things. Well, one, we would, it would really be from, we do surveys um, and we kind of see where the customer need is. So um, with, from our side, um, we look at that and that's where the conversation begins. But then there's also the infrastructure side. Okay, can we handle it? Um, do we have the resources? Are we prepared? Will our partnerships allow it? And then when those two things kind of come together, then we, then we start the expansion. That, that's, how, that's how we have done it. There are some things that we have decided on purpose that we want to do. And then sometimes through our board, we start working on them to get things in place with the board. So, so then we can move into that space. Okay, great. Perfect. All right. Well, hopefully that answered the question, but um, you know, feel free to you know, add in our question if you said that in uh, answer it fully. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, how do you market outside of your CTA? So we use our website, we use social media. Um, we also have flyers. Uh, we use Nextdoor, uh, depending on where, there's a app called Nextdoor that we use. Um, and then most of our marketing really comes through word of mouth. Um, we kind of pride ourselves on our programming ability. Um, we're big programmers. Uh, so once people kind of join our program, they tend to enjoy it. And then we get a lot of our business business through word of mouth and experience. Gotcha. We also use the USTA platforms as well. <laughs> I should say that. Excellent. All right. Yeah, so I just saw a question that came in from the chat from Paul. Was right. asking, I'm not sure if you, if you would be to answer this, but they, I guess you could potentially. Um, they asked like, uh, you mentioned that uh, they use... Uh, so UDC has new course coming online soon. They have been reluctant to open the course to use by the general community. Um, how many colleges are CTAs? I guess um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Jerry. Like from your you know, from your experience working with the national side, like do you see many colleges that are CTAs? Typically, I don't see colleges that are CTAs. And typically, what a CTA does, and you'll see that on our website. Um, there's a, there's a document there, it's our school's document with best practices. What a CTA does is reach out to the school and they connect to the school. And then you, ha you typically have to speak with the, in a college space, I guess it would be the athletic director or whoever the, who's the head of their athletic department to get them to join as an organization member. Um, and then you partner in that way. And it's, it's kind of an ebb and flow. It's not typically the school is a CTA. Right, yeah. That's, that's, that's not the business that they're in. They don't typically like to do that. They would prefer the CTA to do that. They become an organization member and then you all partner. Yeah, and that's why I kind of see too as well. Uh, all right, a couple more questions came in. Uh, uh, what is one tip or advice you would give a newer CTA uh, that you wish you had known when you, uh, when you launched your, your CTA? <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say... Uh, if you can find an individual who can focus on the volunteers, who likes to volunteer and likes to, has a good network of people who like to volunteer to get your board in place and also to kind of get your committee of volunteers in place. Um, because what happens is even though you have staff that do certain things, um, we all, in the tennis business, there's so much that's done um, out off the court and outside of business hours that, you know, having some volunteers who are passionate to kind of do some of that for you. Uh, so you don't have to use a lot of your budget on things that really aren't um, being done based on expertise. Uh, that, would be, that would be good to have in place, a nice volunteer base. Um, whether it's two good people or 20 good 
to so good, not so good people, but some extra hands to get some of the some of the work that has to get done in the beginning done. Okay, good, good. Um, I guess there's another question from Paul. It looks like uh, it said, do you know of, of schools that have their team members volunteer with CTAs? Um, Absolutely. I would contact. I know Paul. You know a number of a lot of people. So I would, I would contact any. Um, head coach or tennis director at any of the universities near you. And um, there are university programs in place. Um, that's some of, some of what they need to do as well from their end. I'm not sure if the Tennis on Campus Committee um, is doing this program based on COVID, but I know that they put a program in place uh, for those teams to uh, actually get a financial incentive from the USTA if they partnered with CTAs and NJTLs. So that's something, um, I'm not on that committee, but that was something that I know was in place. It was something that MTEG utilized uh, the term before COVID. I don't know if, if, the, if, obviously we didn't do it during COVID and I don't know if they still have it in place, but um, two years ago, we utilized that program. Yeah, I, I was gonna mention, I think, yeah, schools are always like colleges are always an excellent source for uh, potential, you know, people to volunteer. College days yeah. can also turn into an opportunity where they the um, the team gets to meet your program, and then you can, that's also an opportunity where you can have those individual conversations with um, players who may want to volunteer and may even want to work. Great. Um, all right, uh, that uh, that's kind of related to the volunteer side of things. Um, uh, just said, do you have a transition plan to maintain long-term volunteers? So I guess, I mean, that's a good question to general, like, that's volunteers, like how do you keep them? Uh, so we, um, and you know, it depends on um, how long your board has been in place, right? So we have, we have boards that have been in place for 30 or 40 years in this section. And then we have, we, we have some, um, what they call friends and family boards and then, and then everything in between. So, um, for MTEG, you know, when you come onto our board, it's a three, it's a three-year um, term, and it's also there's also a the third year is a transition, and we're encouraged for you to find advisory board members, as well as if you don't want to move into the advisory board space or you don't plan to stay on to try to find your own replacement. Now that is just because we're a small board and a tight-knit group, and that's kind of just. Um, it's not in our bylaws, this kind of just an understanding. But then as far as the volunteer space, we start with our parents that are in our program, right? So when you sign onto our program at different levels, there's a certain amount of volunteer hours that you're required, mainly because our prices are below, below market, well below market value. Um, so there's some volunteerism that is kind of expected. Okay. Great. Um, that's great. All right. A question is like, is there any um, CTA outside of Atlantic do you think that are like good examples for people to check out and follow and why? Outside? Yeah, outside of Mid-Atlantic, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, if you look, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't want to answer the question, but if you, if you look on the, on the USTA Community Tennis website, there, if you scroll down, there's a place where you'll see CTA stories, and they are, there's a list of large and small um, CTAs, urban and rural, and those are kind of some of the ones that we've picked out, um, and, and you'll see some of their stories. They're not all, you know, straight to the top success stories. There's kind of, you know, these hills and valleys and kind of their journey. Um, of what to do. So you'll, you'll see some in Inner Mountain and Middle States, um, some of the newer, some of the newer ones in the South. Um, so you'll, there's about 15 there. Can we put that in the chat, actually, Alice? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I'll, find it. I'll find it too. Yeah, that's, I think I, I had it somewhere here before. I'll find it. Um, I'll find it well. It's, it's, it's like the spotlight, right? There's like a spotlight. Right, the section. spotlights. Yeah, okay, I have it here. Let me paste that. Yeah, so if you go to that link and you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a spotlight for different uh, places. And um, yeah. And I've, I've, um, I've, I've seen all those stories 
um, through, through the last couple of terms. And I definitely um, think any of those stories um, probably could help you through your process. Right. And there's also quite a few that are from the Mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's- uh, we're, we're, You know, we're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, another kind of question related to coaches and volunteers is like, you know, where do you typically go to find them? I think we talked about the, uh, the college space, but like, like where else would you find that, that help? <laughs> okay. Um, some of the, so some of our, some of um, the coaches that we found are through the NJTL network um, in general, as coaches move around throughout the country. Um, some of them we get through our relationships with PTR or PTA. Uh, and then some of them uh, for summer, you know, are our returning players. Um, that we kind of uh, have put through a process and then uh, we have coaching education ourselves. I would say that the volunteers mainly come from the parent space or sometimes through our education programs, the, the, um, the organizations that we work with, uh, they are looking to volunteer. So it's, if we hear of organizations that are looking to volunteer in the community, we immediately reach out to them and I, I will say that coaches are not easy to find, um, but you have to you have to constantly be on the on the lookout for coaches, even when you don't need one. You you kind of have to be in that space, and you need to be willing to groom them. You need to be willing to put them through coaches' education, and even maybe assist them with their certification. Okay, yeah, I was actually I was gonna actually follow up on that piece on your end. Like how like what type of like education do you provide to your coaches? Yeah. Well, our so our lead coach is Malcolm Green. He's USPTA and PTR certified. Uh, so once spring comes, he has a coaching training once every two weeks for new coaches or coaches who have only been with us for a year. Uh, and some and he he attends a number of trainings, but also I assist on my end if they're not certified. Um, take them through the process of getting certified and um, following up with them to make sure they get their certification. Got it, all right, all right. Okay, um, all right, so I look at a couple of questions just kind of generally speaking about the um, Mid-Atlantic and national. So like from a, a national perspective, like how does Mid-Atlantic stack up with like grant opportunities and other support for CTAs, like as compared to other sections? Is that something that you could help answer on that? Yeah, I think so. Last year, the committee, we kind of went through that. We, we did a, um, we had a task force that went through the various sections um, individually to kind of see where everybody was. We ended up not putting that list out <laughs> because uh, it, there was such a, a variance in what people do. And it really kind of depends on how large your section is. I mean, just to, some of the background is, you know, di different sub different sections have different budgets and they have different priorities. I would say that Mid-Atlantic has a number of grants that are available and uh, you definitely should, like Alex said at the beginning of this, make sure that you apply for them. A lot of them go unused. Uh, and, and the trend is among the sections is if you're if the money is offered and it goes unused, then maybe that's not where you should allocate your funding. And all of that work is done a year or two in advance. So a good a good place to start with ensuring that there's grant money within your section or any other section is that you apply for it and use it. And then they'll say, okay, there's a need. So there's a need. So we need to ensure that we put this in the budget. But I do think Mid Atlantic has a number of grants that are available. Uh, and I, some sections have more, but I would say that, that they also are larger sections. Like for instance, an average tournament in Texas has 130 players in it. And there's 10 tournaments going on every weekend with 130 players in it. So they're gonna have a different grant allocation than the Mid-Atlantic, um, just because they're a larger section. Southern is kind of the same way. I would not say that um, based on percentages that Mid-Atlantic is much different than any other section. Okay, great. Um, and also go, and just remind me of something too that I'm not sure many people know about is, is that our section does have these uh, junior player scholarship um, grants. Um, so uh, that's something that if you know of any juniors that would benefit from that, uh, make sure to check that out. So I just put the link in the, in the chat so people can, can take a look at that. Okay. 
Um, yeah, Alex, maybe we should, um, I guess they put the, whatever the link is for, for all the, for the location where people can look for grants throughout mm -hmm. the year too. Yeah, I'm gonna find that out too. Yeah, I'll do that, I'll dig that up as well. Um, yeah, and actually I had a question for you on my end real quick, um, Jerry. It's, uh, I guess from, uh, I know you mentioned you know, insurance is a big piece that ECTAs should take advantage of. Like, on your end, what what, uh, what are like natural resources do you find that you use often that you think others should also use more often? I use the webinar. I'm, I, I get on every webinar. The main reason is because, um, well, from the CTA space, I'm a, I'm a part of the process, but I also know the guest speakers that they are going to typically have on the webinar are going to use real life experiences. So you may have a you you may, you will definitely have the CTA um, perspective, facilities perspective, parks perspective, but then you'll also probably have a member from a different department within the USDA um, that you actually get to verbally hear from and ask questions to. And then we like to have at least two uh, members from the community, right? So from the volunteer space, I'm not a staff member, right? So um, my role is really to say, okay, I've been listening to the community. This is what they say that they need. This is what they want. Doesn't mean that the staff is going to do it, but it's my role to say, this is what it is. What can we do about it? So then some of the guest speakers, they're in the same space. So this is what I went through. This is how I solved it. This is the resource I use from the USDA, or this is the resource I use from the community. And kind of sometimes when you hear those experiences, it helps you instead of kind of just reading a website. It helps you, you know, kind of digest and translate it into your own scenario and, and problem solve a little easier. The other thing is the health check and the resource guide. Um, those are very important because they're updated consistently. Um, and we use our, our, our committee has uh, 15 members and it's very diverse across the country. So that information is information that that we gather th from throughout the nation and not just specific to mid-atlantic priorities but it's information that you definitely could use here in the mid-atlantic excellent all right um okay so now the question is um <clears throat> where have you had the most success of fundraising i think that's part one and then do you apply for grants outside of tennis so it's like a two-part uh, so the first question is where have you had the most success fundraising uh, well, we have um, two what we call pillar events. So we have um, a scholarship luncheon, and that would be for our graduating seniors. Um, we, we have success fundraising there um, because one, we have some specific fundraising we do for our outgoing seniors, and it ties to the education side, which really is what's most important. The goal is you know, to get these um, youth clearly graduated from high school and hopefully into uh, college scholarships or college in general. So that's one. And then we have an, an end of the year event or, and we've had, we had our first get gala after five years, but the, an end of the year event. So there's kind of a build up to that. Um, but yeah, we, we, we use grant, we, we apply for grant funding, obviously within tennis. Um, then we reach out to foundations. We had a development manager um, and he reached out to different foundations as well as other grant opportunities um, that are not within tennis. Donations uh, and also our board require, is required to, to have a level of fundraising annually. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so that, that's when you would recommend to other CTAs that the board should also? Absolutely, because what happens is um, for me, Yes, I know a lot of people. Yes, I reach out to them. Yes, they want to assist. But if I know, I'm just going to throw out a number. If I know 100 people, then my board member knows 100 people and they know and, and, and they know people that I don't know and they have resources that I haven't tapped into. So um, part of the board responsibility is to take part in that. And I definitely would spend time in encouraging them. And sometimes depending on where you are in your organization, making it a requirement um, at some level that, that they fundraise or donate. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I'm kind of curious too, like for uh, your, your board of, you know, for your board, for your CTA, um, I guess how 
like, I mean, I guess, how do you go about finding, like, like I guess, yeah, what, what I, when, you, when you think of a board for a CTA, who, who do you look at? Like, who do you think would be the best fit to help, um, that will that, that bring value to the organization? Uh, so, well, you know, there's a, there's a, there's officers that need to be had, right? So we start in that space. Um, the first thing the, that I've learned out of, the, I mean, just really six years is that um, as far as their resources uh, and maybe even, you know, what their resume brings to the table, they're, if they're not interested and engaged, then that's probably not a good board member. You want someone who's interested, passionate, willing to, I mean, they're volunteering. So they, they need to be willing to participate and act on behalf of the organization. So, I mean, when I first think, I think of people who are excited about what I'm doing and people who, who say they want to, you know, approach me and say, oh, okay, I would like to be a part of this. Or if I'm thinking of them, then definitely, you know, as I go through the recruiting process, really listen to what they're saying. Don't try to make that person be the board member you want them to be. They need to already come. They need to already come really kind of prepared to do the job, the volunteer job. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Next time I have is, uh, let's see, can or do you know of CTAs with uh, RFP, RFPs to operate and manage municipals, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say that word, attendance uh, facilities and municipal, I can't say um, the word, no, but yeah, 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 any, yeah, what, how do you respond to that? Well, uh, I'm sure there are some, like, you know, I don't know everyone's RFP situation, sure. um, but I would definitely say that CTAs, I would think the ones that you kind of have seen in the community, now the question is, if they have an RFP, are they a CTA? If they're a CTA, do they have an RFP? I don't know. I don't know what's in everybody's books, but it's fair to say that if they've been in a facility for a couple of years, or you know, they're kind of a mainstay there, that they probably have an RFP. But then I would have to look and see. Okay, are they a CTA? And sometimes you have people who are doing, who are in facilities, who who just need to, who probably are a CTA, but maybe they haven't registered, you know? So there's some of, some of what I do is educating them. And then, I mean, I have, I've done that a few times, not in the mid Atlantic, but in other spaces and said, oh, okay, well, um, have you thought about being a CTA? And then they didn't really understand kind of some of the things I explained today. And then, and then they participated in the program and started using the benefits. And typically the people who are in facilities who aren't CTAs, are really good candidates because they're they're very passionate. They want to grow their business. They want resources to kind of go make their their business easier. Excellent. All right. So yeah, I try to make sure that we have time to sort of a few things I want to um, uh, just remind people of before this uh, wrapping our end. But on, on your end, Jerry, is there any other like like final words or like any last thing you want to share with the group before we start wrapping up? Uh, yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, if you, if you need me for any type of resource, feel free to send me an email, reach out to me in any way. I have no problem answering your questions or uh, sending you the resource or connecting you with somebody who may have the answer. Definitely reach out to, to Alex in the section. I, I'm sure that people do not probably use the section resource enough. I know they don't use the national resources enough. So, I'm assuming it's probably the same. And the more interaction and the more use, uh, the more opportunities will become available. If, if people don't use the resources, then there is the assumption that they are not needed or let's take our resources and put them where we know people are gonna use them. So ensure you do that. And then also just have fun with it. Once you get your infrastructure in place, you know, be creative. Um, with your CTA, see what's going on in the community uh, and where tennis can be a benefactor of that and the players in the community can be a benefactor of that. Oh, great, thank you. thank you so much, Jerry. And again, appreciate you taking this time out to chat with all of us here. Um, and yeah, and I, I want to reiterate that, reiterate that um, um, for anyone on the call, uh, reach out to, um, you know, you reach out to Jerry, but reach out to me or people from the 
the section office, uh, you know, we're, we're here to help support you all. Uh, but if you don't know who to go to, uh, just reach out to me. And I'll, I'll, I'll direct you to someone that will, that will, that will, that will help you out. Um, but yeah, we are, yeah, I know on our end, we're trying to find more and more ways to um, engage with the community. And that's why, we, that's why we're doing this webinar series. It was, uh, right. it was a request from a lot of, uh, a lot of CTA, a lot of people out there that were looking for more of these opportunities. Um, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, I, I think I apologize to ask if your Jerry, if your daughters are still active in tennis activities. <laughs> oh, to... uh, my oldest daughter is high school tennis now. She's in ninth grade. She's playing. She's been playing. Um, she's actually been playing this year, and she's doing well. Uh, she has two more matches to go. And my youngest daughter is a gymnast. She wants no parts of tennis whatsoever. <laughs> right, she's, she's tired of everyone asking her if she's going to be like her mom. So she's like, right. no, I'm not. I'm going to be a gymnast. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um yeah uh, i was gonna say um just a reminder that, that there is going to be a a, a huge uh, grant coming up uh, called grow the game grant um that uh, i think all cta should at least uh, apply for uh, if you're doing any programming for uh that oh, sorry, any, any program that supports uh bringing tennis to new or returning players uh, so that's going to come out more in detail very soon um national will announce it on the 20th and then uh, we will, like, from the section level, we'll also be shooting out some information on that. And June 1st, uh, which is a Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m., we'll be doing a, a webinar to kind of go over more details on that. So make sure to save the date on that piece. Um, yeah, I think, and just one more reminder is that, yeah, if anyone out there that would like to uh, be uh, a host of a, one of these webinars in the near future, go ahead and reach out to me as well, and we can discuss that. All right. But yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all again. I'm gonna, I guess we'll give you guys back uh, eight minutes of your, of your day. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, again, Jerry, it was great information and I'm, hopefully the TTAs that were on this call really enjoyed uh, what they heard, so. Yes, uh, I hope it was helpful and I'll see you June 1st. I'll be on that. Excellent. I'll be on that webinar. All right, thanks, Jerry. Thanks okay. everyone. Have a good day. Thank Bye, you. Everyone.